invite you to turn to John chapter 2. And as you're turning there, I'm going to invite you to join with me as we pray. We want to pray uh, for a few in our church family, and then I'm going to pray for God to work as we look into his word. So please join me. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you that we can come together and praise you, hear from you. And Father, you've also asked us to call out to you in our times of trouble when we have needs. And so by faith, we do that collectively here. And Father, today we lift up Jason Freeman to you. We thank you that you spared his life from the fall, Lord, which he had. We thank you that his back and his spine are, are fine. But Lord, uh, the other injuries, in particular his brain injuries, Lord, we're asking you to heal him. We pray for his upcoming appointments, Lord, that you'd be working and, and help the doctors and all those involved. Uh, we just pray for that. We also pray for Laura and for the rest of the family that you will help them to be patient and may they continue, Lord, to turn to you. And then, Lord, we pray for Justin Frayne, uh, who lost his mom just a short time ago, and we pray for him and his dad and his brother, Lord, that you would comfort them and help them in their time of trouble. And uh, Lord, give them the faith to keep turning to you. And Lord, too, we pray that you would use the friend group here at Woodside. Uh, just use them in Justin's life, we pray. And then, Lord, we pray for um, Matt and for Nicole Bauman and their little one, Mason. And Lord, we thank you uh, for the prayers at Citizens where they attend, Lord, that so many have gathered around them. But Lord, we pray for them too. And we pray for this little boy, Mason. Lord, thank you that he's been born. But Lord, we're asking for your healing hand on him as well. And uh, Lord, thank you for the faith of this family. We think of the grandparents, Tony and Cindy Erb, and also Roger and Judy Bauman. Lord, for that whole family, Lord, continue to help them through this time. And again, we commit Mason to you. And now, fathers, we look into your word. We ask that you would grant each of us faith to believe in your son, Jesus. We ask that you would deepen our affections for him. And we ask, too, that you would wean, off, wean us off of anything that would take his place in our lives. And we pray this in his name and for his glory. Amen. If you're new with us uh, here at Woodside, we started a series three weeks ago going through the Gospel of John called What If Everything Jesus Said Was True. And today as we pick up in the Gospel, we're going to read the story about Jesus at a wedding turning water into wine. Uh, but there is so much more in this story going on, and John wants to communicate it to us. John, if you recall, the purpose of writing down this history, this story, this gospel of Jesus, so that we could look at the facts, and he's going to collect the facts, the evidence, and lay, in, lay them out before us, so that we could collect the facts, look at the facts, and we could say, Jesus really is the Messiah, the Son of God. I believe in him. I'm putting my life in his hands. I'm trusting him. And John says, as a result of that, you will have life in his name, eternal life. So John's goal is to help you to see Jesus and to put your faith in him. And with this particular story and this particular wedding, he wants us to see that it's the first sign, the first evidence of who Jesus is and what he came to do and what he offers. Uh, if you are reading through uh, one of the Gospels or in the New Testament and you come across, there's a, four different Greek words for miracle. When Jesus does something, four different words to describe what he does. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptic Gospels, similar Gospels, they typically use the word dunamis in the Greek, which we translate as dynamite, it means power, he, he, uh, they typically use that word for one of Jesus' miracles. John doesn't. He uses the word semeon, which means a sign. He wants this to be a sign for you to see who Jesus is. Now, again, we all know a sign, the purpose of a sign is not simply that it's a sign, right? So you're, you see a sign for Elmira, 10 kilometers. You don't look at the sign and say, oh, what a beautiful sign. Look at the rectangular shape of the sign. That's a nice sign. No, the sign is to point you to something else, to Elmira. And John is saying here, this sign is an indication of who Jesus is and what he came to do for you and for me. And uh, this wedding that he's attending, John wants us to know it's a little preview of another wedding to come. 
So if you're here today and as we begin and you're not yet a follower of Jesus Christ, uh, if you're going to reject Jesus, that's nah, not for me, uh, make sure you reject the real Jesus that you wouldn't uh, misunderstand who he is, especially um, this version out there today, the Americanized Jesus where he's draped in a flag and he's got a sword. That's not who Jesus is. There's so many other inventions of Jesus. Make sure you reject the real Jesus. And who is the real Jesus? John wants us to know. He's the one who brings joy. The one who came into this world so that you could have joy not to take it. If you're here and you think, boy, if I follow Jesus, if I give my life to him, my joy's over. Like, I want to be happy. And the story here, John, will, is saying to you, if that's you, you don't understand the first thing about joy. So Jesus wants to bring you joy. As we go through life, we're all going to have times when we suffer, there's sorrow, there's pain, but I want to ask you, as you go through your life, underneath that pain, that sorrow in your soul, is there a well of wine, if you will, that you drink from? Is Jesus underneath all of that? And when you get to know who Jesus is, you will find yourself, no matter how bad things are in your life, that you still have this well from which to drink, this well of joy in Jesus. Because if Jesus, everything he said was true, it means that if you've put your faith in him, that you know after your suffering comes glory, that your sins are forgiven, that your guilt and shame has been removed in Christ, that death, your death has been defeated, and eternal life awaits you, that one day your faith in Jesus will become sight, your hope in Jesus will be realized. Your best days are still to come. So John chapter 2, and John wants us to see who this Jesus is and what he offers you and me. So let's look at this wedding and the miracle he does there. Beginning in verse 1. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. So Jesus is at a wedding. Did you know that Jesus likes weddings? God ordained weddings, he invented, created weddings, designed them, marriage, that's his idea, and he's at a wedding, he's honoring the couple that's there. Weddings are good, public ceremonies, uh, vows, covenant, that's of God, it's a good thing, he's at this wedding. But did you notice at the wedding that they're drinking? There's drinking, there's wine, did you notice that? Does anybody else have a Bible like that? It says wine? Okay, so it leads to the question, and again, this story is not about drinking, but it leads to the question, wait a second, as Christians, are we allowed to drink? What do we do? And I want to say that this is one of those gray areas. Scripture uh, doesn't say don't drink alcohol, but it does say don't get drunk with alcohol. And I want to say, especially to those young people here, that you feel the pressure to drink, that you don't have to drink if you don't want to. I know for myself, growing up, when I was in high school, uh, there was pressure to drink. When I was in university, and especially as a hockey player hanging out uh, for a certain period of time before midnight at a fraternity, uh, I was pressured to drink. Uh, when I was in the uh, workplace, uh, going to regional events and flying to a, some national events, I was pressured to drink. And it wasn't like, no, I'm drinking because I'm better than you, I'm holier than you, not at all. It was I chose not to drink as a follower of Jesus. So young people, you don't have to drink. But you can drink if you want to. But if you do drink, you need to be mindful of other people. Romans 14 says that you're not to be a stumbling block to anyone. 1 Corinthians 8, you're not to be a stumbling block to, to anyone. And then 1 Corinthians uh, 10 says that, that you are to... Think about others and how it might affect others when you drink. So all that to say 
is that as Christians, we don't have a casual attitude towards alcohol. Yeah, we drink, part, let's go, give me another beer, give me another glass of wine. Okay, we don't. We use wisdom and we say, okay, I'm going to enjoy this from God. I'm going to enjoy it, but I'm mindful of others around. Okay, all that to say is that it's a gray area, but we need to use wisdom. Uh, so I don't have any alcohol in my house. If I go to the odd wedding, um, might have a glass of wine. I'm not sure. It all depends on the environment. Is everybody good to go? Okay, good. By the way, this miracle is not about wine, but I just wanted to, hey, it's there. In the first century, wine was symbolic of joy, of blessing, of celebration. If you were in the first century, you were eking out a living. Life was hard. You weren't going, hey, I got some spare time on my hands, spare money. No, you were working, and you come home, and there would be a meal, and you go to sleep, same thing, over and over. But a wedding was a special special time. It was the highlight of the village, of the community, because at the wedding, you could have some fun, and the wine represented the blessing of God and some fun. And so there's this wedding that Jesus is at. Notice his mother is there. We're told that she was at this wedding as well. Now, the mother of Jesus, it's not surprising that she was there. She was probably likely related to, to uh, someone getting married. Now, as we go through the book of John, um, John's going to give us a lot of places uh, uh, throughout the land of Israel. I want to take just a moment on the map here and show you just kind of um, some of those places. So um, here in the land of Israel, in the lower region territory, that's Judea. Uh, the middle territory is Samaria. And then the upper territory is Galilee. And you'll notice in the text, John says, on the third day. So he's picking up the story. Last week, we heard about Philip and Nathaniel, uh, James and Andrew, or sorry, John and Andrew and Peter, the five of them, that they were on the, the Jordan River. And on the third day, so three days after their last encounter, Jesus' encounter with Nathaniel and Philip, they head up to Cana. And notice the, they would go through the village of Nazareth. That's where Jesus uh, was brought up. Remember, he's born down in Bethlehem here. Parents flee to Egypt. They come back, and they settle back in their hometown of Nazareth. So Jesus is brought up there, uh, it's, uh, and Cana is just up the road from Nazareth. After this, we're told, John says they're going to go to Capernaum, which is the home base of Jesus on the Sea of Galilee, and then eventually uh, next week we'll find him down in Jerusalem. So the point being is that Mary was from Nazareth. Her, the generations would have gone back, and she probably was related or she knew someone in Cana. In Nazareth, there was probably about 500 people max in that village, and Cana at the time had 50 to maybe 100 people. So she's there, Jesus is there, and his five disciples, not his 12, five disciples are there uh, at the wedding. And so the celebration is in full swing. People are just enjoying, they're having fun, enjoying celebrating the couple getting married. And then the wine runs out. This is a big deal in that culture. It was a big deal. The groom, who was responsible for the wedding, um, somehow didn't have enough wine there. If you go back a year earlier, the bride and groom would have been uh, formally uh, betrothed to each other. They would have signed something, but they would remain apart for a year. And during that year, the groom, he was to prepare a place for the bride, so he often would build an extension on his parents' house. That's where they would live. And for that year, he would just get everything ready, and he was responsible for the wedding. He was responsible for, you know, financing it and everything. I said in the first service, I have one daughter. If she should get married... I want to say to the groom, I'm a biblical guy. <laughs> this is how it should play out, right? So the, the, the bridegroom, it's his responsibility. And if the wine runs out, and they lived in an honor-shame society, um, that was not good. It was like he and his bride would have egg on their face for like decades. This was not a good thing. And Mary, who is probably related or a close friend, has a role to play, She's like, what do we do? I'm going to go to Jesus. And she comes to Jesus. Jesus, the wine has run out. 
What is, if you were Jesus, what would you do or say? Like, stop and think about it. He's 30 years old. Mom, I'm done with the chore chart, okay? Like, you know, I'm older now. Why did she go to Jesus? Possibly because 30 years earlier, when she was pregnant with the one who would be the Messiah, and there was no man involved, it was the Spirit of God, that she knew he was special, that he was a special child, and now that he had some disciples following him, maybe this was the time that he would begin to show himself and show some power that he was capable. That's a possible reason. But most likely, he, G, uh, Mary went to Jesus because she'd always gone to Jesus when she had a problem. Joseph, Mary's husband, is not in the story. He's not in any of uh, the stories with Jesus' public ministry, so we can likely assume that he is dead. So who is Mary going to go to? She's going to go to her oldest son, to Jesus. And stop and think about it, how lucky Mary must have been, right? To have a son like Jesus, never had a bad idea in his life, never had a wrong solution, never said, oh, mom, I you know, told you to do this, but man, I should have done this. Jesus was the most wise, intelligent, resourceful, and yet the most loving and kind and compassionate person that has ever existed. So of course, obviously, when she's got a problem, the wine runs out, she's going to go to Jesus. Now look at Jesus' response. Woman, why do you involve me? For any of you guys that are married less than, say, a year, please take it from someone that's been married more than that. That's a statement that will get you in trouble. Right? <laughs> do not say that. Woman, why do you involve me? And for all of you teenagers out there, especially those guys, right? I've got my new life first. Hey, go clean the garage. We've got company coming. Woman, why do you involve me? <laughs> Say what? I'm trying to be like Jesus. He said it, right? Okay. Now, why did he say that to her? Now, again, when you read the Bible, you want to read it in its original, like what was happening at the time. And in that day, the word woman wasn't disrespectful. It wasn't rude. It would be translated in our uh, uh, time today as ma'am. So it's not disrespectful. But it's not intimate. It's not mum. Why did Jesus respond that way? Woman, why do you involve me? Because Jesus is beginning his public ministry and he's redefining his relationship with Mary, his mother. In other words, from now on, you will come under me. For 30 years, I honored you as my mother, but now I'm not doing your agenda. I'm doing the Father's agenda, that, I'm gonna come, that you're going to come under me and submit to me, that you're going to be one of my disciples, just like these other disciples. And that's why Jesus, when he's dying on the cross in John chapter 19, that um, loves his mother and cares for her, but he, sa she sa he says to her, Woman, behold your son. Again, drawing attention to the fact that Mary is a disciple, a follower of Jesus. And friends, that's why we believe that Mary is like us, that she's another follower of Jesus. She has no special status, and Jesus wants to make that clear, and he makes that clear here. Woman, why do you involve me? And then he takes that, that I'm about my father's agenda, not yours. And he takes that and he says, the second statement, my hour has not yet come. I want to encourage you to go through the book uh, of John in one sitting, take a couple hours, and notice the certain words that are repeated, like believe. But you also find this phrase, my hour has not yet come, re repeated. What's Jesus referring to? He's referring to the hour, his death on a cross. He's saying to Mary, Mar Mary, I'm going to reveal myself in my ministry as I go along. And it's going to lead to a cross. And it's on my Father's timetable. I'm going to show a little glimpse of glory here, a little glimpse of glory here on the way to the cross. But I'm not ready to die on the cross yet. Now what is interesting, what's Mary's response? She's going to say, um, 
to the servants, do whatever he says. So in other words, I'm coming under his will. But Jesus then will do the miracle, not because Mary wanted it, but because it was part of the Father's will. So we read in verse 5. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, so they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. Mary says, Jesus, can you help? Jesus gives his response. Mary says, okay, to the servants, do whatever he says. And then Jesus says to to those serving at the wedding reception, see those six stone water jars over there? Fill them. Fill them up with water. I've been at a wedding where we've run out of water at our table, and I've kind of waved down or I, you know, when the waiter comes by and, hey, could you fill up our pitcher with water? Anybody else? Okay. And if you ever said, hey, see those six jars over there? Fill them up too. No. Jesus says, fill them up. Why didn't Jesus say, hey, fill up the wine bottles on each table? Why did he point to those six stone water jars? Because of what they represented. In the, in the time leading up to Christ, in the Old Testament, Old Covenant, there was this thing called purification and, and different ceremonies uh, associated with that. And uh, one of the uh, rituals would be that when you went to a wedding, those stone water jars, they pour out some waters and all the guests would have their hands washed. And then when the dishes were dirty, the utensils, they would be cleaned with that water. And what Jesus is going to do here, he's going to do a miracle because he's going to say, you know, the old water of Judaism, the Old Covenant, It's now being replaced by the new wine of the new covenant, by the gospel, by me. And so John is going to record that for us, that he included in there the detail about the six stone water jars, because Jesus is going to say something about himself. I'm the wine. I'm the the best um, drink that there is. He's pointing that out in that story. Now notice that when he says, fill them up with water, somehow between them filling them up with water and the head waiter, the, the master of the ceremonies, the master, the MC, the guy who's in charge, somehow in there, it's changed to wine. And we say, wait a second. Okay, we all know where wine comes from. It comes from grapes, which come from vines, which come from seeds, which come from other seeds. We all know that you need sunlight and earth and water and a wine press. Jesus didn't use any of that. He simply said, bring it over. He could have at least walked over to the six stone water jars and said, could I get everybody's attention? Wine. What a miracle. No, he just simply, bring it over to those guys. If you don't believe in miracles, um, you know, oh, come on. Let me tell you, the greatest miracle of all is the in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We say the grace. That's that's the, uh, let me rephrase that. That's the miracle that you start with, Genesis 1-1. If a God can create a heaven and an earth, Psalm 113 says he stoops down to see what he's made with millions of galaxies, millions of stars, all of this, that he, with his laws of nature, can suspend those laws or supersede those laws. Again today, science is pointing to God, not away from God. As the tools become uh, better, we see more of the complexity and the vastness of our creation. If God can do that, everything else, it's okay. And he can take some water in some stone jars and turn them into wine. The, the head waiter tastes the water which has turned into wine, calls over the bridegroom. Why the bridegroom? Because he's responsible for the, the wedding. And he says, man, 
I gotta take my hat off to you. Most people, when they're having a party like this, when the palates, your palates are sensitive, they bring out the good wine, and then after you've had a little, then they bring out the cheap wine. But you've done just the opposite. And then Jesus rushes in and says, no, it wasn't him, it was me. No, he doesn't do that. Saves the day for this guy and his bride. John wants us to see something here. He wants us to see the guy who turned the water into wine is the guy who is about joy and blessing and celebration. He is a God of joy. And so John ends with this in verses 11 and 12. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples. There they stayed for a few days. John says that this was the first of the signs, and again, the sign is intended to point you to something. The miracle is not the water and the wine, that that's what it's about. It's about pointing to who Jesus is, what he can do, what he offers you and me. And John is saying, Jesus is the one that not only has all the power and is great, but he is good. He's one who came to give joy, who comes to give wine. So his glory is revealed with this miracle. But notice too, the disciples believe. And if you're here today and you say, you know what? If I saw water turning into wine, I believe too. Not so fast. John, when he writes this gospel almost 100 times, uses the word believes, and he makes sure that we know that when he's piling these evidences up, that there were people witnessing a miracle who had different responses. So two people can see the same miracle and a different response. He said some believed and some didn't believe. And what was the difference? The heart. These disciples believed because they were seeking the Messiah. They had been waiting for him, and then they saw evidence of that power, and they believed. But friends, you can have all the, we can have the evidence of the Gospels before us about Jesus, and some people will believe, and some will say, no, I don't believe that. What's the difference? The heart. And if your heart is truly seeking God, if you're like, I think there's a bigger story going on than just my little, tiny little story, three score and ten years. If you're seeking God, he says, he makes a promise. If you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. So miracles are about the heart. Disciples believed. So let's talk for a few moments about the real Jesus. Who is he? He's the God who brings wine, the God who brings joy, not to take it. And what's interesting, as Jesus is at this wedding, He's thinking of another wedding. Have you ever been at a wedding and you're like thinking about your wedding or maybe am I going to have a wedding? He's thinking about another wedding. That's to do with the hour because after his hour has come, after his death on the cross, Jesus knew that he would rise again the third day. And it was because of that and what awaited him that he could endure the scorn, the shame of the cross because of the joy set before him, which was you being joined with him. It's called the marriage supper of the lamb. And John, who wrote this gospel, the later revelation, writes about being caught up and he gets a little glimpse of the future. And he says, I hear there's around the throne, there's all this loud noise and all this praise and they're praising God. Why? Because the marriage supper of the lamb has come. That the bride united to Jesus has made herself ready. Jesus calls himself the bridegroom. He's the one that's preparing for us, his followers, this wedding where the wine will never end. What did he come to do? He came to die for his bride. If you're new to Woodside once a month, we celebrate communion here because we need to remind ourselves that we're able to drink the cup of joy forever and ever because Jesus loved us so much that he drank the cup of suffering. If you're suffering in your life, you've never suffered on the level of Jesus. He knows what you're going through. But he drank that cup so that you could drink the the cup of joy forever. And here's what Jesus offers. He basically says to you and to me today, I am superior to anything I've created. I'm the one who can make wine from water. Can I remind you, there is no greater joy as you go through life than Jesus. There is nothing better 
than him. Jonathan Edwards uh, used to say that when you became a Christian, you were, your heart was given new sensory abilities. In other words, when you became a new creation, you put your faith in Jesus, you were given new affections, an affection for Jesus. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, it's not about signing a doctrinal statement. Okay, I agree to do this, I'm not going to do this, and I'm going to have fun. Not at all. It's about a person who brings the wine, a person who has promised you a glorious future with him, that where he is, you will be also. He offers you that. Jesus is the highest, most powerful of all sensations we can experience. Young people, look around. There's lots of people chasing satisfaction. But Jesus is better than any created thing. Jesus is better than alcohol. Jesus is better than money. Jesus is better than sports. Jesus is better than a career. Jesus is better than a trip. Jesus is better than a relationship. He is the ultimate joy. And he's the only one where the wine will never run out. I want to remind you, if you're a follower of Jesus here at Woodside, we're calling you to pray. And together we're praying, looking around for people that don't know Jesus. Because all those people that don't know Jesus are chasing things, looking forward to things, but there's coming a day when the wine is going to run out. Ernest Hemingway used to try anything and everything. Eventually took his life, and one of his biographers said this, the wine ran out. Only in Jesus will the wine never run out. You're here today and you're searching. I'm going to ask, let me stop and say it this way. If you, what's, what are you looking forward to in your future? And if it's all about the next party or the next sporting event or a trip or a wedding or a musical performance, I got tickets to this, I'm going here, buying this big house, big car, all of this. There's a place for that. There can be a place for that. Look forward to that. But is that it? Because what you're really searching for as you chase those things, you're searching for the God who made you, who wants to offer you himself the wine that will not run out. For those of you that have accepted Jesus, do you know there's no greater a union in life? He's the ultimate union. We all were made to, to be seen, to be known, to be loved. And it's great when another human being sees us and knows us and loves us. We're part of a group. That's awesome. But you know who sees you the most, loves you the most? It's Jesus. And when you understand who he is and your relationship with him, he relativizes so many things. He relativizes your need to get married. Hey, if you want to get married and you get married, that's a good thing. But if you... Uh, are going to be single, that is a good thing as well. Here at Woodside, we honor marriage. We don't idolize it. And if I am single, that's okay. I, I'm going to use that gift. But as I look to the ultimate union when I see Jesus, and if you are here and you are married, he relativizes your need for a perfect marriage. Okay? Again, young people, when you get married, your marriage is not going to be perfect. Okay? Can I get an Amen. And again, okay, right, right? And it takes the pressure off of that person having to be perfect. And yes, you're to work together, Christ at the center, to have a more loving and kind and thoughtful marriage. But wherever you are in the marriage, you're like, oh, I wish it was better. You're always reminding yourself that you've got the perfect union with Jesus. Not sure in your life when your best days were. were. Maybe it was in your 20s, 30s, 40s, maybe they're now. But friends, the reality in Christ, your best days are still ahead. Do you know your destiny? You're going to go and be with Jesus. We're going to a wedding where the wine never runs out. As we go through life, in all of our pleasures, Jesus is better. In all of our sufferings, Jesus is enough. And may we together experience that reality. Amen.